This video is brought to you by Hi, there's Glidus merch now. You can get a The Dragon Show shirt or hoodie, or a Kyburn's Jetpack Shop mug or sticker if you're into jokes from three years ago. Links above, below, and under the couch cushions. Also, we released an album. Please listen. Everybody, stand back! We've got another episode of The Dragoner Show, and I'm going to do analysis to it. <laughs> Welcome back to Credits Watch. It's been 10 years since the last Glidus video. I mean last episode. So lots of things have changed, including everything except the music. Damon's finally got his own spot on the board. Good for him, now that he's married to Lena Valarian and had two kids with her. Rhaenyra, in the meantime, has produced three kids of her own that we'll just pretend are also Valarians for the time being. And off in the distance, you can make out that Alicent and Viserys now have... Three children. I don't know what you're talking about. There's only three. Anyway, here's the show's new theme tune. I'm going through changes. Get it? It's like because of all the changes and also there's a horny teenager. You get it. So it's ten years later. Glad you're still here. The king will die. It may be months or years, but he'll not live to be an old man. Show us what you know, idiot! House of the Dragon's second pilot begins with this person, who I have no idea is, giving birth to some kid who doesn't even have a name yet. What a loser. Not only is this such a strong open for a brand new character, the scene itself is ridiculous on a technical level, being these minutes long shots with lots of moving parts. You reckon there's gotta be some hidden cuts in here, but that's a part of the craft too. The episode opens with a three minute shot of the birth, and then another three minute shot of the trek through the keep to visit whoever this is. Many aeons ago, I ragged on the opening shot of The Long Night, a 90 second take which itself has many moving parts. I called it pointless because I felt the only reason to make this a single long take was to feed the director's ego. But here we are three years later, and the same director is opening this episode with the same technique, but now four times longer. Now it could just be that Sapochnik's ego has grown four times bigger in the meantime, but there's so much more going on in this scene. The Long Night's opening shot basically just establishes tone and basic geography. These shots also do that, in addition to kickstarting this half of the season's plot, pairing the current episode thematically with the previous one, and introducing us to three brand new characters. Oh wait, silly me. <laughs> That's clearly Lenor. Two brand new characters. What a fantastic introduction to Emma Darcy. Very convincing grunting right there. <laughs> I've never given birth myself, only ever received it, but people who have themselves ejected humans say that this was an uncommonly well done portrayal of the process. Oh look out, it's the afterbirth! Well, I think you got a little leak there. Either that or... What's this guy's name again? Greg? Pete? Shane? Whoever he is, I think he was pissing blood in the hallway while no one was looking. The Queen has requested that the child be brought to her. Imagine doing this to a mother just after giving birth. Fuck that for a laugh. I can barely go for a walk after a hefty shit. And I gather that most mothers like to spend at least eight minutes hanging out with their new kid before presenting them to their stepmother. But even though she knows for her own health she shouldn't do this, she does it anyway. You should remain a bed, princess. Yes, I should. Help me dress. Because she refuses to not be with her newborn, and she especially refuses to let the queen have the satisfaction of thinking her weak, of letting her have her way. Let me take him. No, she'll get no such satisfaction from you. Lenor. Wait, I thought Lenor was married to Rhaenyra. What the hell happened? Anyway, he's like, yo, the kid's a dude. Nice work. Because he doesn't get girls, so he'd rather raise sons. Was it terribly painful? Did it hurt when a person came out of you? I'm glad I'm not a woman. Ah, huh, maybe he was the top all along. This show still has surprises, even for those who have read the book. It is a privilege to be amongst the first to congratulate you. Thank you, Lord Caswell. We'll let you know when we need a flaccid greeting. Unless you wish to carry me down those fucking stairs. Gee, I wonder if anyone else we know would do that sort of thing. This is absurd. This is an absurdity. Maybe they're not so different after all. Music goes hard here, by the way. Oh, it's fucking cranky cop. It's hard to make out, but I think Lenor glares at him as they walk past, which makes sense. Oh, I like everything about Olivia Cook. Venera. Wait, what? Okay, who are these people? I'm so goddamn confused. I've got to bring an expert in to help me with this. It's a segue. So this is Rhaenyra. What? Rhaenyra Targaryen, princess, heir to the throne. But that was the little girl from the last episode. Well, now she's a, she's a woman. What? What girls grow up, 
she has become an adult. But this is a new character. Well, well no, it, it's a different actor. It's a actor. new actor. It's, it's a, it is a new actor, that's correct. However... I'm correct. You are... Well, you're not <laughs> correct. <laughs> because, in fact, this new actor is playing the same character, Rhaenyra Targaryen. You're telling me that that is the same person as that. The very same. By Jove, you might just be right. I still don't get it, but I'm just going to take his word for it. He seems to know what he's talking about. Geese never forget a slight, real or imagined. Yeah, okay, I'm dropping the bit now. It wasn't that good to begin with. The decision to hand the two lead roles over to different actors halfway through the season was met with some controversy, but it was absolutely necessary. And the casting director did a brilliant job of finding Rhaenyra's and Alicent's that look like themselves. Alicent says, You should be resting after your labours. Which is, again, a brilliant introduction. Simultaneously, she's putting on a face of concern as a magnanimous stepmother, and she's being snarky towards Rhaenyra. The next thing she does is try to get the princess to admit weakness. Tell you fetch a cushion for the princess. But Rhaenyra stands strong. There's no need. I do not require a chair. This display of restrained antagonism is all the confirmation we need of the direction their relationship has taken since the last time we saw them. The king enters and, oh my fucking god, he looks fine. Everything's fine. Nothing bad will happen. His arm's just taking a break. It'll be back soon. Where is my grandson? Bring him to me. Lenor decides, without consulting his wife, that the prince's name is My Dead Gay Boyfriend. Rhaenyra doesn't take too kindly to this, seeing as she's the one who, you know... <laughs> And he didn't even have the courtesy to impregnate her himself. How rude. It's an unusual name for Valerian. Don't be rude, Alicent. Lenor's just a real big fan of Game of Thrones. Have you seen season four? Potatoes! Of course, being a desperate nerd, Alicent's read the books and already reckons that Rhaenyra's kids are actually bastards. But for viewers who haven't read Fur and Blur, the show makes a cute little mystery about this circumstance, with the queen immediately demanding to see the kid and Lenor saying, What could she possibly want? This very intrigued look Alicent gives the kid, and everyone's reaction to, I do believe he has his father's nose. <laughs> And then the nail is hammered in at the end of the scene. Do you keep trying, Selena. Sooner or later you may get what it looks like you. That all said, while I understand why they changed it, I do kind of miss the ambiguity around Rhaenyra's kids in the book. Well, yeah, it's mostly cut and dry. There is still some plausible deniability, especially with their grandmother Rhaenys having black hair from her Baratheon heritage. The benefit of the show being unambiguous with this is that now it has the opportunity to explore the wacky dynamics of this family, what it means on a personal level Level to Rhaenyra, her boys, and the men in her life that she for sure committed this adultery. I do hope the labour was easy. It seems that no matter what else happens, Viserys will always be thinking of Emma. I think I called the midwife a Susan! And well, yeah, she probably deserved it. In the princess quarters, we meet the rest of the family. Jace, Luke, and Harwin. Legally, the kid's father is Lenor, but their daddy is Harwin. They've got seahorse stickers on, but everyone knows they should actually be wearing stickers with three wavy lines representing rivers joining together at a hat. Look, I don't think they're going to sell that well. Okay, big brain move to give us such a wholesome scene with the family. The brothers choosing an egg for their newborn sibling, Rhaenyra responding as a tired mother would. That looks like the perfect one. Harwin telling us how he justifies spending so much time with the kids. Lenor being like, oh yeah, right, it's your kid. No, you can't hold the baby. Notice Luke touching the stove here and Jace looking out for him. Oh, oh he does the dad bounce. Sleep in front of the commander of the city watch. Terrible lack of respect. He's so funny and handsome and Australian, of course she would fuck him. Lenor sends the boys back to the dragon pit, worrying that people might get suspicious about Harwin taking them away for so long. Yeah, smart move, mate. Wouldn't want people asking questions about Harwin. Joffrey isn't the only cute little baby in this episode. Here we meet Lil Vermax. Ain't he adorable? <laughs> Oh my god, he's beautiful. Hey, do you think this little hole in the ground is the same as this little hole in the ground? We meet non-baby Aegon, who is bored, and Aemond, who is already my favourite. Oh, and look who made it! Darren is in the show! You can clearly see Alicent's kids dressed in Hightower War green, and Rhaenyra's in Valarian blue. Neither of them are adorned in the black or red of House Targaryen, perhaps signalling that factional loyalty is more important to their mothers than actual family loyalty. And uh, yeah, I think that's a pretty 
pretty well supported statement. Dinner time, baby! Jace doesn't have complete control over Vermax quite yet, but we learn that Aegon does have a complete bond with his dragon, Sunfire. Once they're fully bound to you, they will refuse to take instruction from any other. This is a well integrated, law based clarification on how dragons work that becomes extremely relevant in the next episode. Some writers have to work for years to forge a bond with their dragon. For others, though, it can happen in a single moment. So here's a weird thing. Looking at the official AO3 account of David Peterson, the guy who made the Valyrian dialogue, it seems that this scene was initially supposed to be Luke and Arax instead of Jace and Vermax. Maybe to leave room for the older brother already having a strong relationship with his dragon, but for whatever reason it was changed. Inconsequential, but interesting nonetheless. Whoa, dead sheep, cool. Aegon is a spacey weirdo. He and Luke have a hilarious prank planned for Aemond. Aegon seems to revel in the torment, like he gets a kick out of manipulating his brother. He's old enough to know how this could affect him, but Rhaenyra's kids, I don't know, it seems like they think it's just harmless fun. Just harmless fun! Aemond's new dragon doesn't blow me away with its design, but the CGI is impeccable. If nothing else, House of the Dragon is a story about how bullying a kid will eventually make him completely normal. Aemond goes wandering off into the dark of the pit on his own. Being a dragon rider is so important to the Targaryen identity that he's basically obsessed with the idea of getting one for himself, which is why the pink dread incident sticks with him so harshly. He's obviously aware of the danger presented by waltzing into a dragon's den on his own, but he considers this more important, and the only time a man can be brave is when he is afraid. We meet probably Dreamfire, the dragon of Aemond's sister, Helena. Note the comparative resemblance between her and Daenerys dragons, Drogon, Rhaegal, and Viserion. This is because Danny's dragon eggs were likely Dreamfires from like 60 years before this, when she was ridden by girl boss Rhaena. Anyway, that's beside the point, which is that the lovely Dreamfire wants to be friends with Aemond, but the kid gets scared and runs off. Poor Dreamfire, her only friend is... Well, next scene. We meet Helena, and she is absolutely precious. Don't anyone let anything happen to her. I mean it. If anything happens to this girl, I will go goblin mode, and I refuse to elaborate on what that means exactly. In quite the change, they've chosen to make Helena literally neurodivergent and a minor. I mean, look at the way her mother rolls her eyes when Helena is telling us cool facts about her favorite arthropod. This exact situation is very familiar to many people with autism. Just like when you go on 40 minute long rants about the dragon show and everyone tells you to shut up because you're holding up the queue. There's lots of interesting discussion going on about Helena. It's common for allistic writers and actors to inaccurately portray autism, but I see lots of people, autistic or otherwise, over the moon with Helena. Some people are saying, oh, she's just a dreamer. And obviously, yeah, she's got them Targaryen prophecies rattling around in her head. You will have a dragon one day. He'll have to close an eye. But Viserys has dragon dreams too, and he's not portrayed as visibly neurodivergent. Same with Aemon in Game of Thrones. They're both cringe normies. Whereas Helena clearly exhibits certain traits that are classic coding for ASD. Touch aversion, flat affect, hyperfixations, lack of eye contact, and a minimum of eight Wikipedia tabs open at any given point in time. Put simply, she's completely fucking based. Even Bran wasn't like this. It could be that Helena's ASD is why nobody thinks that she's a dreamer too, you know? Nobody's going to take her genuinely prophetic statements seriously if they just ignore her and her bug talk, and also if she's always mumbling them because talking to other people is weird. I relate to her! So much! Viserys seems to not give a shit about any of his kids with Alicent, which is a shame because he'd probably have an awesome time hanging out with Helena. It is beyond our understanding. Nature is a thing of mysterious works. But I guess he's too busy looking very healthy. Just as with Jamie's dyslexia, we're not going to hear anyone in the show use the word autistic. That would be heckin' anachronistic. But Helena is autistic, and she's my little princess, and I will listen to her talk about this millipede for as long as she would like. This one has 60 rings and two pairs of legs on each. That's 240. Okay, now it's my turn to be an autistic little princess. In all known millipedes, the first three legged segments have a single pair of legs and then all other segments have two pairs. So they don't have a multiple of four legs total. It's always offset by two. As I refuse to believe Helena doesn't know this. The last ring has no legs at all. I'm forced to accept that this is a fictional, fantastical species of millipede. Of course, Gurm is known for messing with the number of legs 
legs we expect things to have. So this is par for the course. A bogey. How does this metaphor work? Good news, everyone. I have a convoluted and dated metaphor to explain. Um, now that I've dropped some millipede lore, I guess I have to vaguely prophesize something. Um, there's always money in the banana stand. Anyway, I know that eventually everyone in this show will die sooner or later. That's how time works. Except for Damon, he's the Night King. But I hope Helena makes it long enough to play Silk Song. She'd make fun lore videos. Sure. Sure! I really love this little exchange. It is beyond our understanding. I suppose you're right. Some things just are. Because from Alison's point of view, her daughter is beyond understanding. Eamon rocks up, escorted by Arik? I think? Because apparently having a sneak peek of your sister's dragon isn't allowed. Helena knows what he's done. He did it again. Unclear whether this is just from inductive reasoning or prophetic knowledge, but I'd like to think it's because she knows what Dreamfire knows. That'd be cool. But your obsession with those beasts goes beyond understanding. Beep. After all these years, she still isn't used to the family she's married into. All these years and I still feel like an outsider when I come here. Have you seen television? Don't worry, Eamon. Plenty of dragonless Targaryen before your time have found greatness. Like, um, I don't know. Sarah's pretty epic. Majel seems cool. So, um... Pimp or none? Those are your options. Alison threatens to have Eamon grounded, but upon learning that the other kids teased him for not having a flying oven of his own, she takes the matter up with her husbando. Male model Viserys doesn't think it's such a big deal. He actually assumes that it was Aegon who did it, but Alison ignores that, which is funny considering all the talk of a parent's willful blindness towards their child's misdeeds later on. The willful blindness of a father towards his child. Alison says she's surprised that Rhaenyra's kids even have dragons because she thinks they're only half Valyrian, but so are your kids, Alicent. We shall continue this afternoon, Eddard. Eddard? I wonder how Valyrian sounds in a Yorkshire accent. What? No. Alicent has been aware of Rhaenyra's sexual exploits since before she even married Lenor, but has been forced to never talk about it, even though it's blindingly obvious. From her point of view, Rhaenyra really has made a joke out of the whole institution of royalty, and her line being Viserys heirs is an insult to Alicent's line. Since Emma's death, Alicent's whole line life has centred around her family's ambition to get their blood on the throne. Her life belongs to this political system, and in her head, so should Rhaenyra's. Alicent plays by the rules, the traditions, the system as she was told it would be, but Rhaenyra clearly flaunts the rules and nobody seems to care. Not to mention decency itself. The implication that it's completely fine for Rhaenyra to raise three bastards as heirs to the throne is basically the realm, the crown, the king saying that Alicent's life didn't even matter. This could drive anyone to madness, and yet, for now, Alicent manages to restrain her anger to hushed tones in private meetings. Of course, from Rhaenyra's perspective, she's just living her life as well as she can within the system that killed her mother and tore her best friend away from her. The point... Not my point, the show's point, is that the conflict between them is produced by the power structures they are beholden to. And Otto. Mostly the power structures thing though. Vicera says hey. Maybe my daughter isn't a big salute, because this one time, horse genetics happened. Get your punnet squares out, kids! I wish he brought up that Lainor's children would have black-haired Baratheon blood in there, and that three of their supposed grandparents are whiter than Vermont, you know, maybe throw a bit more cope on his little fire there, but ultimately Alicent brushes it aside anyway. Now, Viserys sure as hell doesn't want his beloved daughter ruined by consequences of her own actions, so yeah, maybe let's just... Not also, the whole war thing. Ali and Chrissy have a classic bitching sesh about their former friend from high school. Okay, I, I just can't not address it. Does House Cole, a fucking nobody house of stewards from the Stormlands, happen to know the location of the Fountain of Youth? Everyone else has aged like 10 years, but the only difference for Kirsten across the time gap is that he's had a shave and a haircut. Two bits. <laughs> fucking unsubscribe for that one. I love the vitriol with which they speak of Rhaenyra who until now has basically just been kind of a person. Spoiled c That was beneath me, Your Grace, I apologize. No, Crumbo, embrace it. It's not beneath you at all. You're right down there with it. And now for the most symbolically rife scene in the show so far. Prince Aegon, nude as his name day, cranks Hog out the window. He's drunk, he's horny, he's living his best life, and he's going to jizz all over the people of King's Landing. Icon. Bit of a danger wank though, isn't it, when your mum employs a no-knock policy? She seems completely unfazed in spite of her apparent moral 
righteousness. So this must be a common occurrence. Like, she'd be surprised if he wasn't having tower top tug time when she totters on in. Aegon doesn't see his half-nephews as political rivals, but as fellow children to f*** around with. They're his family. Jace and Luke have dragons, they're half Targaryen, and Aegon doesn't care about the political implications of anything. It's evident that the prince is happy to live his life completely carefree, making use of his incredibly privileged position to just piss time away as hedonistically as he can. Life, for Prince Aegon, is one big orgasm. Of course, he doesn't want to take the blame for anything. It was Jace. It was the two of them. Because consequences just don't seem to be a part of the royal agenda. You may cuff him about as you wish at home. Oh, yeah, no, I don't like that. Renew will ascend the throne and Jocera's Targaryen will be her heir. So? That is... One hell of a question for a drunk dropkick. In response, Alicent attempts to instill in her son the fear that her father once put in her. You're no fool and yet you choose not to see it. You are nearly a man grown. How is it that you can be so short-sighted? If Rhaenyra succeeds him, war will follow. If Rhaenyra comes into power, your very life could be forfeit. This, for me, is the saddest part of the coming conflict. Any attempt at reconciliation between Otto and Viserys, between Alicent and Rhaenyra, gets kicked down the line because of the influence they've previously had over their children. Look at the amicable relationship between the children of the princess and the queen. They don't seem to have a problem with each other until Alicent does this. Is that one day you will be our king? But I don't want any of that. I'd rather... Rather what? I'd rather... Just... Wank! Do you think he just picked up where he left off after she left, or...? This is a very emotional scene, so please don't look directly at my naked butt. Yay! Look at him, he's my little dude! And the big old lady! He's got a thing for milfs. He has a thing for milfs, which is of course the plural of, of milf. Oh man, he must think he's so cool. Oh! Look at him up there, he's such a little rascal! Caraxes and Vega sharing a lovely dance together makes me think of nothing in particular. Moving on. Sometime in the past 10 years, Matt Smith has married his cousin's daughter and had two children with her, and I love them. But more importantly, he's acquired an even more different wig. They're having dinner with this Pentoshi fellow who, like, makes a connection between them by citing a thing Aegon once did. In the spirit of honouring our storied alliance. That is generously worded. To put it lightly, he wants them to stay here, in Spain, offering them a great deal of land, a castle, high society privileges in Madrid, in exchange for defence against the southern cities and Dawn. You can immediately see Damon's interest, and Lena's uninterest. Prince Damon wants nothing more than a way to eternally avoid the bullshit of his brother's kingdom, and the Prince of Pentos gave me a castle is a pretty good reason. We are without responsibility. They are using us. It's refreshing, isn't it? But Lena is defined by the freedom of the sea and of the sky, being a Valarian and a dragon rider. Spending her life tied to a single castle in Essos isn't her lot. She wants her daughters to know her house and to know freedom. We are the blood of old Valeria. We don't belong here. Valeria is gone, we don't belong anywhere. I kinda love what this says about Daemon and Viserys. King Viserys spends his life trying to recreate the glory of old Valeria. He literally lives in a desperate attempt to capture it. Meanwhile, Prince Matt Smith in a slightly more different wig spends his life trying to define his own glory and looking for affirmation from his brother. The lost magnificence of their people and their empire constantly plagues the brothers' lives. By the way, Daemon and Lena have, for the past 10 years, basically lived the life chimp promised to Rhaenyra. Disowned heir, loving spouse, free in the east, unconcerned with King's Landing, living the high life with no strings attached. Just like all perfect solutions, it eventually falls the fuck apart. Oh, also during this little speech, the princey boy works in some cheeky exposition. Your family has dragons. Three now, mayhaps four in the future. Oh, she's Pognat! I see that now. At my end, I want to die a dragon rider's death. Ah, oh, you want to die a dragon rider's death, do you, Lena? All right, here are your options. Being old, stroke, dawn, question mark, probably poison, definitely poison, gravity, Harrenhal, question mark, being old and depressed, being old and mega depressed, Valyria, question mark, took an arrow to the neck, appendicitis, and lastly, 
childbirth. So it shouldn't come as a surprise that Lena makes up a new way to die, asking Vega nicely. Plus childbirth, question mark. Lena gives an impassioned speech about her desire to return to Driftmark. Damon then kisses her tum tum and doesn't respond. Oh, you're still here. Weird, I was done listening to you. So a lot of people were upset when this episode came out <coughs> in September that there weren't many scenes showing us the beautiful family life between Damon, Lena and their daughters. And uh, I I think this scene shows us perfectly well the kind of family man Damon is. He's not great at it. One uncharitable reading would say that he only likes Lena as an extension of himself. The wit, the freedom loving, the glory, the dragon riding, the weird incest sex. But beyond that, he isn't all that interested. He teaches Bela Valyrian because he sees their family as the last vestige of Valyria. But he doesn't care that his wife wants them to go home. This is missing some of the story though. We've seen how terrible terrible Damon can be to people he doesn't like, and here we see him showing love to someone after 10 years together. He's certainly much mellower than he was before the time jump. Their relationship isn't wild and bombastic like two teenagers falling in love for the first time, it's nuanced and refined like two adults who have been together for 10 years. According to Gurm, Damon is made of light and of darkness in equal parts, and I think it's good that the show is starting to show us some more light. FUNNY SEGUE! Back in the other place, Sir Khrushchev- God, this bit is getting annoying. Cunt plays favourites with the princelings while Viserys and Lionel watch their grandchildren. Viserys is all- Ah, wonderful. Beating the shit out of each other will bring the two branches of my family I've horribly mismanaged back together. And Lionel's like, Mm-hmm, yep, sure. Aegon seems pretty good at this, but he's far more interested in the obvious. So challenges him and Aemond to Fox Only No Item's final destination. He three stalks both of them while Harwin hangs about and worries about his own sons. Seems the younger boys could do better with a bit of your attention. In response, Sir C a very well-adjusted and normal person, forces a very small child to duel a much older and better trained child. Bit of a proxy war. So happens that the boy is strong though and puts up a hell of a fight. The coaches give pep talks before round two and when Aegon eventually pins Jace, Harwin has had enough and calls a timeout. Ah, uh, looks like you're teaching the prince to be a fuckwit. Damn you, those should be my bastards. Then C says the thing. Most men would only have that kind of devotion toward a cousin or a brother. Or a son. And Harwin gives him the beating he's long been asking for. Harwin smash! But yeah, Viserys is like, oh, that's just not on. And the Kingsguard peel him off. It takes four of the strongest men in the world to keep him back. <laughs> Yeah, they definitely did that on purpose. No, it doesn't matter. Hey, fuck ass. You just publicly accused him of treason, you shit biscuit. Oh my god, look at the little baby. Wait a minute, I have an idea. Mum! Mum! How old is this baby? More uh, three months old? Am I meant to say newborn? No, it's fine. It's not a newborn no, baby. No, it's clearly not. Thanks, Mum. Rhaenyra finds out about a thing and drops in on Lionel berating Harwin. We've never seen Lionel lose his cool before, so this feels really huge. Out of shame, Harwin! God, I love how this is shot. We're with Rhaenyra, looking in, observing, eavesdropping on a dramatic shouting match. Your intimacy with the Princess Rhaenyra is an offence that would mean exile and death. Basically, Lionel says outbursts like this are deadly crossings of the line. Everyone knows the truth and the only thing protecting them all is Viserys playing along. When he can no longer do that, it's all over. But the show puts it so much more eloquently. This flimsy shield alone stands between you and the headsman. And it ties this theme in with the characters presently relevant. The willful blindness of a father towards his child. I wish my father affected a similar blindness. Lenor and Carl show up, drunkenly belting the bear in the Maiden Fair. I fell down. Ah, he's so much fun! Where have you been? Oh, with Carl. Classic sitcom marriage dynamic here, complete with a best friend named Carl. But it's fantasy, so we have to spell it wrong. Lenor gives Rhaenyra his elevator pitch. War. 
He so wants to go off to have some fun and die in a pointless war. To be back at sea. It makes sense that he'd think so fondly of fucking war, given that he got to do a Star War last time. Let's just hope the thousands of foot soldiers see it the same way. He also tells us about the flamboyant giant Recalio Rindoon, but he doesn't say his name even though it's so much fun. Recalio Rindoon. Lena is brought back down to Earth when Rhaenyra tells him what's going on. Do you know what's happened? Well, you've been guzzling all the ale in Fleabottom. God to know what besides. Come! She means come! She chastises him for wanting to abandon his family. Are you mad? Regardless of who fucks who, they are his sons and Rhaenyra is his wife. She's just pushed a child out of her and he thinks he's earned a break from being extraordinarily rich and getting to do anything he wants in King's Landing. Like his father, he tries to weasel his way out with a sailing analogy. The wise sailor flees the storm as it gathers. But he is not the sea snake and his wife tells him he is not allowed to go out to the war with his little friends. Little Raina is holding her egg up to the fire and singing to it this is fucking adorable. Mum walks in to make a cheeky analogy. Half of them never do you know. What? Hatch. I wonder how this is gonna go. It's you and father and Baylor, because you have dragons. Like Aemond, Raina defines her worth by her dragon having status. Because she doesn't have a dragon, she thinks she's worthless. But Lena relates to her that she never hatched a dragon either and had to claim the most powerful beast in the world by her own right. Raina's parents, Damon and Lena, and her grandparents, Colis and Rhaenys, had to carve their own place in the world, earn their dragons. Raina is like a second son, but for girls. I have to wonder if this is setting up a deviation from the book. That could be interesting. But if you wish to be a writer, you must claim that right. Father ignores me. Aww. See, Damon probably does value Baylor more because she's more like his favourite person in the world. Himself. Just kill a couple spouses and seduce a family member, Raina, and your dad will start paying attention to you. On the rooftop, Lena tells Damon about Rhaenyra's birth. Does your brother mention if this one also bears a marked but entirely coincidental resemblance to the commander of the City Watch? Jeez, what is it with Rhaenyra and commanders of the City Watch? I miss my brother, Damon. As I think, do you? Okay, I've seen some people take this to mean Damon had a thing for Lainor. Now look, Damon is 100% bi as fuck. See, he doesn't even know how to sit properly. But Lainor is for sure talking about Damon missing his own brother, Viserys. Although... Damon has driven the men hard. Has anybody ever told you you're nearly as pretty as your brother? Okay, it is a bit sus. He says he likes Pentos, but Lainor's like, you sit inside all day reading. You! Reading! What happened to you, man? You used to be cool. Now you're a nerd. What happened to him is his sad boy Bono for Valyria. It reminds me a lot of Rhaegar, who had a similar melancholic nostalgia for the days before the doom. It haunts this family. Do you never long for home? No. Don't believe you. Believe what you please. He does long for home, but King's Landing isn't Damon's home. Valyria is. Perhaps I too am not the wife you would have wished for yourself. Lena. She doesn't mind that they're not a perfect match. So few matches actually are. But Lena laments that this life has diminished Damon's spirit. Like Lenor said in the previous scene, he too is a warrior, a dragon rider, a fierce fighter. And a warrior. He is the goddamn rogue prince. And he does not belong here, idling away in the Pentoshi countryside. And he knows it. And maybe Lena, having made her peace. I have made my peace. Chooses to make the most of her own circumstances to show Damon who he really needs to be. Man, I don't know how I'm gonna die, but I really hope it's gonna be narratively resonant for someone. At the small council. Why was this issue not brought before Lord Grover? Muppet! Tully's confirm. Okay, for the uninitiated, in the book, George decided to do a little trolling and named a few generations of House Tully after some Muppets, like Grover, Elmo, Oscar, and Kermit. I am the Lord of River Run. Now, because this is really fucking silly, a lot of us were worried that HBO would rename these characters for their very serious fantasy television program. Luckily, it seems they're embracing the Jim Henson puppet lords, which I think is for the best. It's just a bit of fun and all of these are actual names that have only been associated with
with puppets on a kids show for the past half century or so. The people who don't like this had best remember that the main series has an undead giant whose name is basically Bob Muscles and a dragon named Drogon. Get over yourselves. Dick Crab. Lancel Lannister? God, what a stupid name. There's a guard at River Run in the books named Delp. Delp, utter shit. And how could we not mention Dickon Manwoody? Guy's name is basically Willie McPenis. Picture Maester Honeydew and his assistant. <laughs> In non-Muppet news, Melos is fucking dead now, so Orwile is the Grand Maester, which explains why Viserys only looks half dead. I mean, fine, he looks better than ever, in fact! Lyman Beesbury is still bumbling about, wonder if he gets on with the Bug Princess, and because Lionel Strong has been upgraded to the King's Hand, and hopefully Arm, we've got Jasper Wilde in as Master of Laws. They call him the Iron Rod, for his perfectly straight and metallic Dickon Manwoody. <laughs> Alicent's like, yeah, I don't give a shit about some dumb rocks in the Riverlands, not our problem. But Rhaenyra's all, hey, this is Bracken Blackwood beef. They start wars over spilt fucking milk, breast milk from the teats. Maybe we should arbitrate, because she's seen the way these houses interact. And when Lionel agrees with this good idea, Alicent's like, oh, of course you would. So we see factionalism taking over the small council, at least in Alicent's mind. Rhaenyra does have a good reason to disagree with her here, but it seems that this is typical. The princess and the queen are just primed to take opposite sides on any issue. Case in point, when Thailand brings up the step zones, what is this guy's deal with those islands? It's all he ever talks about. Get another personality trait, Thailand! Again, Alicent and Rhaenyra assume opposite positions, become instantly hostile, and show no signs of meeting on a middle ground. Yeah, I think the Blackwoods have the upper hand. No. We've moved on to the step stones, Lord Beesbury. <laughs> He's so old. Let us be finished. Ah yes, now that we've settled nothing, we'd best be out of here. This whole meeting could have been an email anyway. On the other hand, look at these fucking earrings. She can do no wrong. But Nira leaks some DMs and attempts to bridge the divide between her family and Alicent's, appealing to a sense of unity across the house and their long lost BFF ship, and proposes to betroth Jason and Helena. Alicent looks disgusted by this because of all those things I talked about earlier, and because Rhaenyra just asked her to give her only daughter over to a bastard. But Viserys loves the idea because it legally binds the two halves of his family, prevents potential future conflict, and he's a Targaryen at heart, and he thinks that the best solution to all problems is more incest. A most judicious proposition. Politically, it's a good move, and Jace is a catch, but Alicent is thinking personally, and morally as well, and she just can't accept this last ditch attempt to save Rhaenyra's skin. She's desperate. To sweeten the deal, the princess chucks on a Cyrax egg. If Cyrax brings forth another clutch of eggs, your son, Aemond, will have his choice of them. Oh, I thought there was no shortage of eggs or hatchlings. I just assumed it was a skill issue. But her nipples are all leaky with milk, so her ideas can't be taken seriously. But we have been lax, and the old monster now lifts its head. Viserys, no! Alicent tells Viserys he can get fucked. You may do as you wish, husband. When I am cold in my grave. But dude, you're the king. You're in charge. Can't you just accept the proposal anyway? I guess it's more complicated than that. He's a big softy and he doesn't want to hurt anyone's fifis. I do not need the blank. I'm not tired! Any man who says I'm not tired is a grumpy little boy who needs a hot chocky and a bedtime story from the Grand Maester. I guess he's not that big a fan of how infantilizing his condition is. Against Alicent's wishes, Lionel comes by to hand Vizzy his two weeks notice. He's going to retire to be a fabulously wealthy and powerful lord and he'll take his hot son with him because turns out it's not a good look when you publicly obliterate a Kingsguard for saying an obviously true thing. It's a wonder I could visit the privy alone. I love Paddy so much, you don't understand. I'm starting to reconsider which Viserys I'm talking about when I say I'm a Viserys simp. Ah! No! Your advice is being sage. Unlock my self-interest. She knows what he means. Viserys makes him not resign because he won't say the thing out loud. That would get people killed. Do you expect the king to doom his dear daughter to exile? Or? But he's allowed to take Harwin back home to go be Lord of Harrenhal for a bit, as a treat. That didn't go the way Alicent wanted, and you can see she's annoyed that Lionel's able to get through this without admitting Rhaenyra's infidelity. So she storms out to go complain to another one of the mean girls. Larry meets with the queen for... Pie. Mm. Pie. Hmm, 
I wonder why she's taking her shoes off. That's weird. Maybe she just likes to be comfy. Meat without wine is also a sin. Mm. I love him. He's completely unhinged, but in such an unassuming, non-violent way that I'm sure will last. His honor's always been a millstone about his esteemed neck. So far, this show's biggest strength for me has been portraying complex familial relationships. And we saw how Lionel and Harwin both have dedication to their own different versions of honor, which clashed earlier. But now Larry says honor is dumb and weighs people down. So it's a shame that we've never seen any meaningful interaction between Laris and his family. Hopefully we do get some of that before ah uh, who are we fucking kidding here room service pops in to replace the towels i guess if alicent's maid talia is a spy then why would she announce herself like this when she could just continue listening at the door ah uh, you'd reckon there'd be guards posted there even though we saw alicent walk in and there weren't. I don't know, it's a weird little detour. The Queen laments that in terms of genuine power on the council, she more or less has stood alone in the 10 years since Otto Mouse trapped himself back to Old Town. If only he were hand again. I cannot say, my Queen, that your father would be impartial in this matter. No, but he would be partial to me. Oh, well, at least she's not delusional about what she wants. Because he's just a sweet little soul who wants to help a poor lady in need of a deadly arson, Larry limps merrily down to the dungeons where he recruits recruits a few miscreants to help him do some crimes. He ensures their silence by rendering them incapable of not being silent. Oh god, we're doing another birth. I still haven't recovered from the first one. This one doesn't seem to be going that well. I think Lane is doing this the wrong way. You must push now, my lady! I don't know, man. From the screams of it, she's pushing pretty hard already. The not maester is like, bro, it's just not happening though. Child will not come. Oh, if that's what you want, then why don't you just ask Prince Aegon? Presented with the same predicament Viserys once faced, Damon chooses to not murder his wife. Th this wife, this time. Or the mother survive it? The difference between his situation and Viserys's is that Damon isn't convinced that he needs a male heir. Remember, Damon only has daughters, but that seems to not matter to him. So the child Lena is carrying is not as important to him as his wife's comfort. Um, suddenly Lena is outside asking Vega to kill her. The big girl is having a nana nap and takes a while to cotton on. Seems like she doesn't want to kill her rider. She's a sweet old lady and she doesn't want to hurt anyone except Dornish pets. But when they lock eyes and the dragon sees the pain Lena is in, she gives in to deliver her a dragon rider's death. Nana Blondell crushes it. Raman Jawadi is firing on all cylinders. And Matt Smith in a hurry rocks up just in time to watch his wife get fucking immolated. Lena! Oh, you'd better not be Agent Oranging yourself. In the boo! Lena doesn't have a dramatic fiery death. Instead, she completes the labor, but the child dies and Lena isn't recovering. She wants to fly Vega one last time, knowing that her body is dying. But she collapses on the way to her dragon, and Damon carries her body back to bed and stands vigil with Rhaenyra, who Lena was close with. It looks like they wanted to give her the defiant, on my own terms death she actually wanted. Which is cool, it makes for a powerful scene, but it also replaces one of Damon's more heartfelt moments in a classic Game of Thrones tragedy. Not that this isn't heartbreaking. So Harwin farewells his family and Jace is like, yeah, okay, he's definitely my dad. Again, I'd have killed to see more on-screen connection between Harwin and Rhaenyra. When Jace asks if he's a bastard, Rhaenyra says, you are a Targaryen. Which is just a yes, but with extra steps. In a sense, she is right. Jace is a dragon rider. He's Rhaenyra's son. And the public, legal story is that he's trueborn. And you gotta remember, she needed heirs one way or another, and Lenor wasn't giving her any. Love how Emma portrays Rhaenyra's anxiety here. Rhaenyra interrupts her husband and his boyfriend in the yard, and deigns to leave as well, thinking caught an unsafe place. The wise sailor flees the storms it gathers. This is cute. They escape their predicament together. She tells tells him to bring Uncle Carl as well. Wait a minute, holy shit. Lenor, Lenny, Carl, Carl? God damn it. What do you say? I don't know, something about being gay. Looks like Homer's gonna have to update his cheat sheet. It's Harren Hall, baby! Hell yeah, I love looking at this place. Someone did leave it in the dryer too long though. Larry's inconspicuous agent has the firefly symbol on him because he knows your dad who isn't so good with faces is watching and might have forgotten what was happening. I think maybe a better way of signposting who this is would be to show us that he has no tongue through someone trying to talk to him or maybe he just goes, ah! 
And that night, I guess, a fire happens. Freak accident, nothing we could have done. Rip to the best hand of the king we've seen in this franchise, and the best baby daddy we've seen too. Apparently Gavin Spokes fucking broke the crowbar he was using in this scene. Lord Strong indeed. The Rhaenyra's show up at their ancestral home while Larry talks about how having a family is dumb beta behaviour. The true Sigma grind set, he says, is murdering everyone who cares about you and gloating about it. You may know what is the right thing to be done, but love stays the hand. Hey, asshole! I'm supposed to talk about the themes here. Fucking steal my thunder, why don't you? Big cock. Now that Rhaenyra's gone, the only thing Viserys has left of his beloved wife Emma is this ring. Aww. Oh, you're not here for symbolism, are you? Hey, wait a minute, where are the baby bones in Lena's Skellingman? Raina and Baylor helplessly grieve for their mother, and I mean helplessly. Damon just kind of looks at them, he says, well, sucks to be you, and walks off. Now, the man's devastated. He's only used to wives dying by his own hand. He doesn't know what to do. Rhaenyra, Damon, you want to do Rhaenyra. Larry speaks of the curse of Harrenhal, while Alicent, uh, wants to die. She lays the blame at his feet. Uh, foot. You pass judgment. But he throws it right back at her feet. Uh. Queen makes a wish. What servant of the realm would not strive to fulfill it? I wouldn't worry about it though. Faustian pacts never backfire. Dude, all I said was it would be easier if my dad were here and you assumed that meant Laris please gruesomely murder your entire family. Another day, another banger, your grace. So yeah, that was cool. Not perfect. It's a huge time jump and I think more time could have been dedicated to some other relationships. It does well with the time at a lot to these things, don't get me wrong. I love Harwin in this episode, I love Raina and Bela and Helena, I just think we'd be better off with more. But I see the conundrum, the thing's already 67 minutes long and I can't think of much wasted time. The biggest sticking point for me is Crunchyroll. I just expected some sort of reference to how he got away with killing Joffrey all those years ago and something more between him and Lenor. As I said last time, it's a hole the audience can easily patch up in their minds, but I don't like that it's a hole in the first place. I think this episode had the hardest task of any of them so far, and it did that task well. It has so much to appreciate, and most of where it falters are in things it simply didn't get around to. Man, that was a whole ass video, hey. Um, at the risk of making it a mixed fraction of ass, here are me patrons. Also, my band released an album. It's called Everything Ends and you can listen to it everywhere. I'm extremely fucking proud of it. Here's what it sounds like. It would mean the world to me if you gave it a shot or some other metaphor for listening to it. And also, don't forget that a merchandising scheme now exists in my name and there are links in the places. Um, thanks for all the support through this season. I know I kind of fell off the deep end for a little bit there, but I'm back and stronger than ever except for all the Glovid 19 poisoning my mortal form. Come back, Glovid 9. Hopefully the length, quality and frequency of upcoming videos will act as compensation. This is an equitable compromise. It warms my heart that all the new subscribers are concerned that the videos are taking a while to come out. Oh, my sweet summer children. You know nothing of the long waits. Anyway, see you in the next video literally fucking tomorrow. Wait, what the fuck happened to Daron? Okay, now it's my turn to be an autistic little princess. <laughs>